Uh, anyway. So uh, I will be talking about containers uh, today, but uh, m half of my presentation is not about containers. <laughs> uh, so first of who here have uh, played with Linux containers? Okay, there are some people. I hope that uh, by the end of the presentation, some of you would uh, decide to join the container camp uh, writing Perl code. For, uh, code. So who am I? Uh, I'm uh, the chief system architect of SiteGround. Uh, I'm also CEO and uh, CTO of two companies, uh, organizing a few conferences. Some of you may know me from uh, EAPS Europe 2014 in Bulgaria. Uh, also teaching some stuff, and I'm maintainer of uh, Linux and Share, uh, Linux uh, SetNS, and uh, very soon, next week, uh, Linux C Group. Uh, so, uh, in 2015, uh, there were two talks about containers uh, in Perl. Unfortunately, uh, I didn't find uh, everything that uh, is available for Perl in those talks, uh, which is uh, not very good since uh, Linux and Share is, uh, I think, five, six years old module. Uh, Linux S is uh, uh, around 2013. Uh, and these were not included. <laughs> so uh, the other thing is uh, how you, why you need containers. Uh, I need containers because uh, I offer containers uh, to my Cube brand. But uh, in order to start containers there, I use uh, LXC or LXD that are tools uh, outside Perl. And uh, all of my management is written in Perl. And I was like, okay, what is the container and what I need to do to make it run entirely in Perl because I really don't need to do a system something. That's uh, something that I really don't like. And uh, currently the only way you can create container uh, Usually, the people what uh, think is uh, LXC, LXD, RNC, or Docker. So these are your options, and uh, all of them require system something. Uh, also, there is another thing for containers. Uh, I'm infrastructure guy, but uh, if you want to run your application sandboxed, like you have an API, uh, it receives uh, some code, uh, some uh, data that. Uh, cannot be really sanitized, you, you're not sure that it can be sanitized, so uh, you want to create a sandbox. So my first part of the presentation would be how you would uh, approach this problem, and uh, I'll finish with the containers that are the maximum security that you can get inside your application. I have some uh, example code, so uh, I hope you understand it a little bit easier. Isolation and sandboxing, uh, I try to be the most complete guide for uh, securing applications in Linux. Uh, I found like uh, 50 different presentations on the internet that don't mention some of this stuff. Uh, when you're using Truth, Truth is uh, well known, uh, when you're using it, uh, try to uh, root in a directory that is uh, not an overlay file system because uh, most of the security issues with uh, uh, root were caused by a uh, faulty file system, I mean uh, the code had a bug in the file system, or usually uh, a problem with the configuration of uh, the overlay file, uh, file system. And overlays are used in Docker, RNC, and most of the, these applications. Uh, also try not to share the whole file system with your application, uh, bind mount what you need inside the truth and nothing else. You don't need uh, more than uh, what your application actually requires. Dropping privileges, you see it's not actually trivial in Perl. Actually, you can shoot yourself in the leg a few times, like five times at least, before you uh, do it properly. Uh, most of the developers simply don't remember that Linux has capabilities and uh, they don't use this feature of the Linux. Uh, also, you need to set limits. Most of your uh, very uh, 
understand very well the uh, U-limits, but uh, I don't think any one of you is using C groups for their applications. This is why I started writing the uh, C groups model because uh, C groups are a very good set of limits that you can apply to multiple processes, not only to a single process. And then you can add Linux namespaces where you can simply mm, separate this application totally from the other applications on your machines, which is actually containerizing this. And the last thing that you can do with uh, your application is uh, using SECOMP. SECOMP is a filter for uh, syscalls that your application can do. So let's look at these things. Uh, true, we have uh, out of the box in Pro, that's nice. Uh, the one thing that you have to remember is that after truthing, you have to do CHDIR because if you don't, you're still outside of the truth directory and you have access to file, uh, files outside the truth. Then uh, setting U limits, uh, it's easy. You, you have this uh, in uh, the POSIX module. Uh, I'm not going to uh, go to talk more about DAOs. Jumping privileges, uh, now this is the funny part. We have this uh, internal uh, variables that we use to uh, change the user ID and change the group ID. And uh, unfortunately, uh, some people mistake uh, the effective user ID with the running user ID because they're so close on the keyboard. <laughs> so uh, the problem is that uh, your run uh, started user ID uh, doesn't change the permissions that uh, the kernel checks. So if you don't change the effective user ID, you haven't dropped any privileges. Unfortunately, uh, okay, I'll continue on the next slide with that. The, the, the other thing is uh, the same problem with the groups. And uh, most of the processes, uh, if you start a program on Linux, you don't have a single group. You have like five at least groups that your user account is a part of. So uh, when you change your group, uh, group ID, you're changing your main group ID, but uh, the other five are left with, uh, with you. So your application still has group access to uh, files that are from those uh, other groups. Usually in C, what you would do is uh, use the init groups, uh, uh, function and it will clear your groups. Uh, unfortunately, you, we don't have this in Perl. Uh, so I found out that, and this is not in the documentation, I don't know why, uh, but uh, I found out that uh, if you use the uh, running group and uh, give it two times the same uh, group that you want to change, it will actually call set groups with uh, a single group and you would actually get uh, the same functionality as uh, init groups, which is quite nice. Uh, for capabilities, uh, you can use uh, Linux PRCTL. Uh, I'll show you in a bit. Uh, then uh, creating a new uh, namespace, uh, you can use either uh, Linux and share. If you want to uh, do the fork inside your application, then you would use uh, Linux and share. If you want to create a uh, new uh, namespace, but uh, inside a new process that is not related to yours, you can use uh, uh, Linux clone and uh, create new process, clone new process. Uh, if you want only to enter in a namespace, like you already have for like uh, 10 containers inside your uh, on your machine, what you want to do is uh, enter one of those containers, like uh, only its uh, network namespace or uh, IPC namespace, and execute some uh, command like uh, connecting to the socket of MySQL inside of that. Uh, you can use uh, Linux ZNS, and these are very, very easy. Uh, if you want to create a control group, uh, you would use uh, uh, Linux C group. Uh, currently, uh, you would probably create the directory initialize uh, uh, the control group uh, and a lot of other stuff in order to uh, actually use that C group. Uh, Linux seccomp rules, uh, you can use the Linux seccomp module, so we have this inside Perl right now. Uh, the proper way 
to actually drop your privileges would be something like this. Uh, you would first create the control group. Uh, uh, a lot of the stuff have to be done before you actually drop your privileges. So uh, some of these stuff can be uh, changed. But for example, why we are creating the control group before true routing? Because the control group would be uh, on at usually mounted at uh, sysfs c group, which is okay. But after you true root, you don't have sysfs uh, c group. If you bind mount that inside your true root, you're exposing a lot of the kernel to the user. So this is something that you don't want to do. This is why you first uh, create the control group in, uh, outside of the true root. If you want to create other directories for your application, you have to do that before you drop the privileges. Then uh, you're setting the U limits. Uh, when you do this, if, uh, for example, one of the limits is uh, for the number of processes that you can have uh, on one machine, when you set these limits uh, and your application, uh, you already have uh, reached the limit, uh, this will stop your application. This is why I'm setting the limits second. Maybe you can swap them first so uh, you can uh, exit uh, right away without uh, doing any stuff on your file system. Then your true routing. Uh, then you may want to uh, drop uh, some of the syscalls that uh, you want to do, uh, you want to allow to the process, and uh, you can uh, drop some of the capabilities or all of the capabilities of Linux. Uh, I have an example for uh, dropping capabilities, I think, in uh, the presentation, so you would understand why. Then you are creating the namespaces. After that, uh, you're in completely different Linux namespace. This means that if you have uh, uh, created uh, with Linux and share uh, all of the uh, new namespaces, you don't have uh, IPC connectivity to the host machine, you don't have networking to the host machine, you don't have uh, uh, file systems from the host machine, uh, your process ID is different from the one uh, you see on the host machine, uh, your user ID uh, may be zero even though you're not root, uh, and you can do a lot of other stuff there. Uh, so when you do this, you're completely different system now. Your application sees completely different system. And then uh, you should drop your uh, groups. So uh, what was it? Parenthes, uh, open bracket, and uh, then uh, drop the username. Last, you drop the user ID uh, because uh, if you drop the user ID anywhere before that, uh, you lose root privileges, so you cannot do anything of the above things. So uh, the problem with uh, setting the user ID, uh, usually what you would do is uh, set the running user ID, the effective user ID uh, group, uh, and then a user ID. And uh, what I have uh, done here is uh, issue the system command simply to see what's happening, uh, what user ID I am now. Uh, what I would see on my laptop is uh, I, I would have first result before uh, why I don't have this? Oh, okay. F my first system and my second system here. So my first system shows me the root, I'm root, uh, I'm group root, and these are the other groups that I'm, uh, that I'm part of. After I switch to uh, 1001, uh, my wife's ID, uh, I change the user ID, but now I have more, even more groups before, or before, because I added uh, uh, Tony's group. As you can see, I changed the user ID, changed the group ID, but I'm still uh, with the groups. So if I change the uh, group ID properly now, uh, what you would see here, <laughs> uh, usually what's happening is uh, if you don't do, uh, if you don't give it two uh, group IDs here, uh, it, call, it doesn't call set groups and uh, you simply do set git and nothing else. And set git doesn't change the, the other groups. So uh, I think this creates uh, a call to set groups. And now I'm left with only with the groups of Tony. This is easier for me and uh, this is the proper way to do it. Uh, 
Jared Tink is, uh, I have a longer example. So this is my ping, which is a normal ping. It should uh, show me if the host is alive or unreachable. I didn't show the whole uh, code, but that's enough. So what I did is, uh, okay, I uh, changed the groups properly, changed the user ID, and then issued system, right? Uh, What's happening here is uh, that I see f uh, that I cannot access the socket. Uh, the net ping has a check for the effective user ID currently. Uh, I had to remove it just to show you this example. So uh, usually you wouldn't reach this part. But uh, after removed, uh, removing that, you see that you cannot create the raw socket. This is because you're now user ID uh, 99. And, uh, Uh, this is normal user and it doesn't have the capability uh, capnet role. Uh, when you have this capability, you can actually create uh, this socket without uh, having root access. So uh, if we add this line here, uh, after the system, before the actual ping, and this is using the PRCTL, setting the effective capabilities, netro, cap netro, to one. When we have this, uh, we can actually ping it. Why? This is a big issue for me because you shouldn't be able to do this. Uh, <laughs> and I'll tell you why. Because uh, now here, your user ID 99, and user ID 99 shouldn't have capability to set capabilities. But it actually did that with user ID 99 and we did the proper uh, thing with the groups. So it's not the groups. <laughs> uh, the problem is here. Uh, when we are setting the user ID, uh, it actually calls uh, set, uh, set e, uh, e uid. Uh, so effective user ID, the, uh, the library function set effective user ID. And uh, this function changes your user ID, but saves your previous user ID in the saved user ID. Unfortunately now, your application can go back to root without a problem. And if your application can do it, somebody that is attacking your application also can do it. So this is your, <laughs> your uh, case here. If you don't actually use set UID directly to clean the saved user ID, uh, you're fucked. So uh, in order to do it properly, uh, you need to include the set UID function from the POSIX module because it's the only function that actually calls directly set UID. After you do this, uh, oh fuck, okay. After you do this, uh, you can now, uh, you can't uh, change the uh, capabilities now, and it's all fine. It's all good. It's how we were uh, expecting it. Uh, one other thing for capabilities, uh, for those of you that are not uh, used to capabilities, don't know uh, how they work, uh, you have uh, the effective capabilities. This is a bit mask that uh, combines all the capabilities that you have. Usually, root has all of the capabilities, usually. So uh, the bitmask is uh, all ones. Then uh, you have permitted capabilities. Uh, these are capabilities that uh, you are allowed to receive uh, if uh, uh, you start an application that has uh, set file capabilities flag on it, like a file option. And then you have uh, the inheritable uh, capabilities, which is another mask, uh, which is used when you're uh, forking or executing uh, another application. So you have this mask and you can say, okay, I want to leave only uh, capnet role. So you set only capnet role there, and uh, then when you create a new process, this new process will have only that capability. But inside your, uh, your application, if you do this here, like uh, set the inheritable, it wouldn't change the outcome of the ping 
because uh, it is for the next process. This process has to drop his uh, capabilities first. So you have to set the uh, effective capabilities to zero for everything except CapNet role. Okay? Okay, uh, so uh, I'm skipping uh, the example for uh, U-limits and uh, it should say SECOMP here, <laughs> sorry. Okay, uh, and we are continuing now with the containers part, right? Uh, creating uh, namespaces with uh, Perl and control groups with Perl. Usually what uh, you would have is uh, a parent and a child process and uh, when you create a namespace, uh, this is this becomes a little bit of a problem because, for example, if you create a new mount namespace in the child process, now the child cannot see any file that the parent can see. If you haven't mounted before that, bind mounted some of the file system to the new uh, root that uh, this child process sees, you cannot actually, uh, from the child, you cannot see any file. If uh, the same happens for every namespace, like uh, if you create a socket in the parent and expect to access it from the child, Unix socket, you cannot because uh, uh, you, when you switch to the new IPC namespace, there, this uh, socket doesn't exist at all. Like these numbers here, these are internal numbers from the kernel uh, for the namespaces that uh, you are currently using. So. If these are not the same numbers on both of your processes, you don't have access uh, to uh, this information. Networking, if you create a new network namespace, keep in mind that you would only have, uh, no, you wouldn't have any interfaces there. You have to create interfaces like uh, loopback, you have to create uh, uh, ETH0, uh, you have to create routing inside of that. Currently in Pro, we don't have libraries for this, uh, which is uh, something that I really hate and I'm working on that also. Because uh, in order to configure the network interface inside this uh, new network namespace, I have to issue IP root commands. <laughs> and this is only system, 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 system. And Pro is not system, right? <laughs> this is not very good. Uh, PID namespace and uh, user namespace, for the PID namespace, for example, if these are the PIDs uh, inside on the host machine, inside the PID new namespace for the child, your process ID can be completely different. Like uh, it can be uh, zero, it can be one, uh, it can be any other uh, PID, num PID number. So all of this is a problem of communication between the parent and the child. And when you create a, a container like with uh, Docker or uh, LXC or LXD, the problem is that uh, it's even bigger because these parent and child are not actually parent and child. You have to separate your application in two. Uh, you have to have a daemon on the host machine, uh, a daemon on uh, the client, uh, inside the container. You have to think about uh, some TCP UDP uh, connection between those simply to make them talk. So this is <laughs> a very big problem. Uh, yeah, uh, also when you uh, change the PID namespace, you cannot even send signals to this uh, uh, process, which is <laughs> very, very, very bad. Uh, okay, so um, if we don't unshare uh, all of the namespaces, uh, this process can actually access different parts of your operating system, like uh, if you haven't created a new network namespace, it still has access to the network on the same host. So, uh, for example, if you want to run uh, your application on the same port uh, in different containers, and if you haven't created a new network namespace, uh, after the first application binded, for example, to port 80, everyone, uh, every other application wouldn't be able to do. Uh, the same goes for sockets and uh, shared memory and stuff like this. Uh, now, uh, what we had missing uh, in uh, Perl, uh, first uh, list of supported namespaces, uh, I'm 
adding this in the next release of uh, uh, Linux and Share, I'm not sure if I should put it there or so or create a new module, but uh, uh, listing all the namespaces that you currently support. Your kernel can be configured to only have, uh, for example, user namespace or network namespace, but uh, not all five of the namespaces that you have, or I think maybe six. Uh, so uh, if you want to see what you're supporting, you have to cut this file. Um, it's obviously easy to, uh, to, to open the file uh, in Perl. Also, if you want to see what uh, control groups uh, you support, uh, there are uh, CPU sets, uh, CPU, memory, uh, block I.O., network COS, and uh, uh, a lot more. If you want to see what the current kernel supports, you have to open this file. Uh, in uh, the Linux C group module, you simply uh, call uh, C group list and uh, it uh, tells you now what control groups you currently have. Also, uh, when you're creating a new C group, uh, you actually have to create a directory with, uh, inside the mount of uh, the C group. Uh, there is different way uh, of mounting the C groups. Uh, one is uh, to mount all of the C groups in a single directory and uh, create sub uh, subdirectories with uh, different uh, C groups, uh, or uh, you can mount only, for example, CPU set in one directory, memory in another directory, block I/O in a third directory, and when you create uh, uh, one director and directory in uh, uh, for example, the CPU set, you have only uh, CPU set control group set up for this. Uh, and you have to go to the other directory for uh, the memory, the other directory for the block I.O. Uh, unfortunately, system the, uh, systemd does this stupid mounting, so uh, I had to support it. Uh, it's easier when all of your files are in single directory like this. So uh, creating a new control group is nice, uh, you're only creating a directory, but uh, if you haven't set uh, same behavior to one, uh, you have to set up the control group because you cannot put the uh, process inside of it because it doesn't uh, contain any CPUs or memory. So uh, a, if you put a process there, it cannot be scheduled anywhere. So it doesn't, the kernel doesn't allow you uh, to put process there. So if this is not uh, set to uh, one uh, here, you would uh, normally uh, cut this file, which is from the main C group, and uh, put the information into the new C group, CPU set CPUs. Again, the same thing uh, for memories. These are the actual uh, memory banks that you have on your machine. And once you have put all of them or some of them uh, to the new control group, now you can actually push a process there. And putting a process is uh, quite easy. You simply uh, echo it uh, inside the uh, the tasks file. Now, uh, I'm going to show you in a bit how you can create this in Perl. Uh, first, what we usually do now is outside process is uh, using system to uh, create the container and inside the container we start this process. The problem here is that even uh, if your application is the only thing that resides in this uh, uh, container, uh, you would use LXC create, LXD or Docker, which is uh, a daemon that uh, is creating your containers and a command that is connecting to this daemon and telling it, okay, I'm starting uh, a new container and this new container uh, you have to monitor. Uh, this is something that uh, your application would want to do, monitor its child, uh, but uh, its, its children, but uh, you can't because you're like uh, connecting to another virtual machine now. And uh, this is breaking your connection uh, of your code. So, let's look at uh, something very simple, uh, an application that is forking and uh, we have uh, a bidirectional pipe inside of it. Uh, this is directly from the uh, Pro Programming Book example, so it's uh, it should be okay. <laughs> uh, then, in the child here, 
What we have uh, done is uh, the first one, uh, after the else, the first one is from the book, and then we initialize a new uh, control group, which is uh, actually doing uh, uh, the make gear inside C group, uh, sys uh, FS C group, and creating the uh, demo one directory. <coughs> it automatically checks. Uh, okay, uh, automatically checks. If uh, you have uh, enabled same uh, same behavior, and if you haven't, uh, it automatically uh, gets the C all CPUs and memories from uh, the previous C group, the topmost uh, C group, and initializes your demo one uh, C group. Then you simply print the uh, process ID, uh, your process ID in, uh, uh, in the tasks file. Uh, I'm using the uh, move pit uh, function because uh, obviously you would, you would be able this way to move a process uh, from one uh, C group to another C group and you don't need to have another function only to issue uh, uh, your own uh, pid uh, to another file. Then I want to unshare all of my namespaces so I have created uh, uh, a very simple um, constant uh, clone container, and this is actually uh, binary ORing uh, all of uh, um, the flags, clone new NS, uh, clone new net, uh, clone uh, new IPC, and so on. Uh, so in order to compact space, now uh, we have created a new container uh, with a new control group. Uh, okay, we didn't root, we didn't uh, uh, set to it here, uh, but uh, this is completely different container now. And these two containers, so the parent and the child, can still talk via the pipe, which is quite nice. Because now uh, you're, you can build your application, put your uh, uh, code that you want sandboxed here, uh, prepare everything in the parent and uh, have all the data structures of your application without actually using Storbo, JSON, uh, BSON, and so on uh, to uh, transfer your data uh, over the network because uh, this container that you're, is running your insecure code uh, is uh, outside of your box. And uh, that's it. If you have questions. <laughs> really, no questions? Um, I, I want to do the similar thing, and I, uh, one of the things I found out is that if, if you separate the processes, I mean, the, the problem is if you have a server starting from, which should not be root, and then you need to become root uh, yeah. in, in order to do all these nice things yeah. again. Uh, so you need a set, set UID in, in, uh, script in, in the middle. Yeah. Script doesn't work on on, on Linux, so you need a, a, a safe wrapper. Yeah. The first thing you should do in, in, in the third side then is to reduce yourself to whatever safe grounds and bail out if, if, if you don't manage. Yeah. Uh, one of the implications I found is, is that you can't you, you break the um, it's it's a nice model it works but but you break the uh, the signal chain though. Because you can't from, from the parent then to, to the signal the grandchild. Yeah, the, the you can. Well. Yeah, you can. Have you found a solution for that? Just set up all uh, No, uh, you can use the bidirectional pipe and that's it. You can talk to your application, but you cannot send uh, signals. Or one other thing is uh, what I have done for me uh, is uh, when the child is created, it sends its PID. Uh, it's process ID uh, back to the uh, parent, but uh, it from that PID, the parent actually can see which is the child inside the container, and that's it. The only solution I found is to, to uh, if, if a process was hung, I mean from completely screwed up, uh, to, to really send out a second process afterwards. To, to yeah, but uh, how can it? Hang up uh, 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 in the in the beginning of it. <laughs> it shouldn't be able to do this. <laughs> and then uh, it it wouldn't start at all. <laughs> no, but if you have a long running task. Then. Yeah, if you have a long running task, but if you already know the process ID uh, from the parent, uh, which is 
still root, uh, you can actually uh, do whatever you want on the child. If, if the parent is root, yes. Yeah, uh, but you have to leave the parent as root, yeah. that's it. Or you can simply leave a few capabilities for the parent, like uh, in the example I showed, uh, we don't uh, drop capabilities at all, even in the child, but uh, we should. And uh, in the parent, when we are dropping capabilities, we can actually drop only uh, the capabilities that we don't need. And if uh, you need, for example, signaling, <laughs> it's bad <laughs> because you would need uh, capsis admin, <laughs> which is like half of the kernel. <laughs> I forgot to show you uh, SetNS. Uh, SetNS is similar to Unshare. Uh, the difference is that uh, you actually enter inside the container. So uh, you have to have a container that is already running somewhere, like your application is running inside uh, one container. This is how you can actually do uh, uh, signaling inside the container, like you're changing the uh, namespace, the PID namespace, to the one of your application, and you can safely, with normal user ID, like 99, uh, send a signal to your application. So again, this is uh, another way to approach your problem. Uh, with It's a lot easier with uh, SetNS because you don't need to uh, remember the process ID in uh, the parent, uh, and uh, you actually you are actually in the same namespace, so it's not a problem. Uh, you have similar issues with uh, shared memory, for example. If you want to change the uh, certain things in the shared memory of another namespace, you have to enter there. So you would usually have uh, a Docker command or uh, Alexi attach, and then uh, you would run a, a per script that you have copied inside this container, right? Now with uh, Linux setNS, you can simply do, okay, setNS to this network namespace of this process, and that's it. <laughs> Anything else? Okay, thank you. Thank you.